In this presentation, I'm going to commit heresy and consider what the effect of altruism could be on the prisoner's dilemma. So, I, and this kind of falls in this category of how essential is the concept of self-interest or selfishness to game theory? And I'm going to basically be arguing that, well, sometimes it's an important thing to assume, but other times not, and that really, in the end, it might be just much ado about nothing. So let's review the stylization of the prisoner's dilemma. And as I said, I don't like it in the first place, but uh, we got two prisoners committed a crime. They have two choices, cooperate, stick to the story, right, with one another, that they've got, they've got a story where they can get off, they can explain away whatever really bad thing happened and get a lighter sentence. But if they cheat, they can also, you know, tell the truth or maybe lie, testify against the other one. And the DA defines these outcomes, right? And the key thing for our purposes here is normally the DA, you know, is going to say, okay, this is how many years in jail you're going to get. If you both stick to your story, I can only send you up for light sentences. If one of you testifies, the other sticks to the story, the testifier will go free, the other does hard time. And then if you both confess, you'll just both do medium time. The normal interpretation of this game is to assume that the players care only about doing as little time as possible they have a specific payoff function, right? Do less time. And it's always said, all right, this is this is what's going in. And, uh, you know, there are some iterations of the prisoner's dilemma out there where they fill in the normal form with the number of years, right? And so we don't have players' preferences over outcomes. We have some material, real-world uh, consequence, right? some objective consequence that is being taken as a utility function. And, well, is that always going to be the case? And let me pose this question for you. Suppose that player one is the parent of player two. You've got a parent and a child in custody. How might that affect the player's preferences and how the game works? Let's take a look. Okay. So I've rewritten the outcomes, right? So let's just say, all right, here are the outcomes in each of the cases, right? Because remember, in a game, each player's strategy, the combination of strategies produces an outcome. And so here we see, like, if both the parent and the child cooperate, stick to their story, parent and child do short time. If the parent cooperates, right, sticks to the story, but the child defects and turns evidence on the parent. The parent does hard time, but the child goes free. Moving to the lower uh, lower left, if the parent defects, rats out the child, the child does hard time, the parent goes free. And then if they both defect, rat on each other, which is the normal, what we think is the normal outcome of the game, they both do medium time. So now let's just ask, what might a parent's preferences be on this? Now, and the, and the key thing here is I'm saying, look, people have preferences over outcomes. We don't say what those preferences are. Sometimes we do. In economics, they frequently say people are rational, they care about outcomes, and what, what they care about is how much money they make, right? So you have this extra assumption specifying the particular utility function, right? Specifying what... Con what the what the nature of the preferences are but in general though we just say people prefer right so what would a parent prefer right what would a parent's favorite outcome be here well and here let's go with this first of all i think the the best thing hey we both do short time right i don't like my kid going to jail but we both do some time and then we're both out together and we have a good life second best outcome well i don't want my kid doing hard time, right? And it's possible a parent might prefer to do time to let their child go free, right? I'll do the time. My kid's got to go free. You got to raise your grandkid. You got to have a life. That, you know, it's too late for me. Save yourself, right? That kind of thing. That could be a, a honest, you know, preference over the outcome. 
The next thing, uh, probably doing medium time, right? Okay, medium time, you know, we don't like that. I'd rather the kid go free, but that's better than the worst possible outcome from the parent's point of view might be that uh, the parent goes free and the child does hard time, right? And now this is all assuming that in, in this parent cares about the kid. Tell me that's a bad assumption, right? The key thing is to recognize that preferences are preferences over outcomes and people are allowed to have any preferences they want, right? And so we're saying here, these are the preferences the parent has over the outcome. Now, we'll just assume that the kid is just like the selfish, rotten little, yeah, because children are, right? I've got, I've got two wonderful daughters. But yeah, there, there have been moments where ungrateful little wretches. So let's just let's just leave the kid the normal thing, right? So the, the child here prefers not to go to jail. Uh, probably caught up about the parent being, but the child wants a life. So we're just going to leave the child normal, all right? And so uh, they have the, the normal preferences we'd expect in a prisoner's dilemma. So let's take a look at this game in normal form now. Given the preferences that are listed below, we can assign numbers as I did in the Prisoner's Dilemma video and basically higher numbers to better outcomes. And so we see this is what we've got. We've got a, a different game. And notice I'm calling it the parent's dilemma. I don't know that it's much of a dilemma here, uh, but uh, it's not a prisoner's dilemma. This is the thing is, okay, suddenly by changing the preferences, the preference ordering, it's not a prisoner's dilemma anymore, right? It's a diff, but it is a game that can be solved. And so we'll just go through the iteration of solving it, right? And so we say, suppose the parent cooperates, sticks to the story. What's the kid going to do? The kid's going to defect, right? And that's kind of the normal way the iteration starts when we did a prisoner's dilemma. But if the kid defects, would the parent, what would the parent's best response be, right? Parent prefers to cooperate in the face of the kid's defection, right? So, boom, we have right there, we've got our Nash equilibrium, right? Cooperate, defect, the parent sticks to the story, the, lets the kid rat him out, and the parent does time, kid goes free. That's the solution to the game. That's the pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Notice in this game, there is not a Pareto superior outcome to that, right? There is no outcome that both players prefer to this cooperate defect outcome. And therefore, repeated play and a lot of the things we talk about in a prisoner's dilemma that makes a prisoner's dilemma so juicy for analysis, it, it's totally not here, right? Because it's not a prisoner's dilemma. We've changed by changing the, uh, preferences, we've, we're looking at a different game. That's all we're doing here. So what are the possible objections to this? And there would be many. Yes, you in the back. I, I see you with your hand up. Uh, you're saying players aren't rational. Well, they are. According to the definition of rationality, the players have complete pre fixed and transitive preferences over all outcomes. And the, the game was solved. I mean, we're assuming that they're going to choose strategies to achieve the most desired outcome. The only thing that isn't self-interested or selfish here, and self-interest, we got to ask what that really means, uh, but we'll put a pin in that for a second. The only thing that's really selfish here is the origin of the parents' preferences. But in game theory itself, without a particular variant, Right? like economics that says people are wealth maximizers or selectorate theory that says that politicians, leaders seek to stay in office or realism that says nations seek to maximize security. Right, Those are stronger assumptions about the nature of preferences. Those are actually more objective preference functions or utility functions. And that's a stronger assumption. In game theory and rationality, Complete transitive preferences, choosing strategies based on achieving the best outcome, being purposive, that's rationality in its pure form. 
this example involves interpersonal comparison of utility, right? That's something you're not supposed to do, right? Is, and, and in general, when people talk about self-interest, right? Uh, they Self-interest in a rational choice model is about acting on one's own preferences, right? Not taking someone else's preferences into account. And the thing here is that, look, the parent never takes the child's preferences into account. The parent just looks at the world and says, how do I feel about the world with, you know, me living outside while my kid does hard time, maybe for life, right? Depending on how you stylize the, 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 the game. And the, whereas normally that's the best outcome in the standard formulation, the parent is just their preference is like, no, I don't like this. Right now, the kid might say, no, I'll do the time for you, dad. You, you, you're too old and weak. You, you got to, you know, so, but we don't care. Right. So self-interest here is more about egoism. My preferences, if we think of preferences as being evaluations of, uh, you know, value assessments of different states of reality. Right. Self-interest here is more about egoism where the, the each actor says my preferences, my judgment about the value of one outcome versus another is superior. I don't care what other people think. I'm going to achieve what I think is the best outcome. Now, their evaluation could be altruistic. And in, in this case, the parent is altruistic in terms of evaluating the reality. But in terms of once the preferences are formed, acts on the preferences anyway, and is still self-interested. And there is no interpersonal comparison of utility being made here. The one objection that I will really see as, as being very reasonable is that, hey, you're robbing rational choice of its predictive power, right? That, uh, you know, a lot of folks do a lot of good work. And I've named, you know, the whole field of economics has done a lot of work based off of the idea that people are, in fact, uh, you know, self-interested and in, in you are wealth maximizers. And now, of course, there is behavioral economics that is looking at other questions and they do break into, you know, they talk about uh, having other preferences, having social preferences and other things. Uh, but more often they're about looking at, at how people make calculations and whether or not they're able to do it or whether they have biases in how they make calculations. And the thing, though, is we have to say, when you make a generalization, if you want to talk about people uh, doing economic activity, then it probably makes sense to say more about their preferences, not that they can have any old preferences, but that in general, you know, they, they want to make more money. Or if you're trying to explain uh, politicians, maybe they're vote maximizers, right? That's, or in bureau, bureaucrats, maybe they're budget maximizers. And it might make sense when making general predictions to have a stronger specification and to go down the route of, of maybe doing something that is so more on the face of it, selfish and self-interested. Sure. Okay. But when you make individual predictions, is that necessary and is that a good idea? And if you're going to look at somebody's policy position, right, and you're doing a forecast and you're saying, what's this person's favorite policy position, right? So maybe it's a president or a legislator. Well, you know, it becomes an empirical question what their preferences are, not one that's based off of any Basically, it's, it's an ontological assumption, right? When we say that people are wealth maximizers, you're making an assumption about the way the world is. So you're making an ontological assumption. And, you know, is that necessary? Is that desirable? And, and there are certain cases in forecasting, particularly, where it's strictly an empirical matter, what people care about. And so, you know, maybe Mother Teresa was an altruist. Maybe she did care about the suffering of people. That was her underlying preference of things. Maybe that went into when she evaluated the world and said, this is what would be a better world 
and I would like to achieve it, maybe she did take into account the suffering of poor people. She probably also took into account some aspects of her position, but, you know, it's complicated, right? And we don't, and my point is, we don't need to make the assumption. What we should do is treat it in that case as an empirical assumption. And we should also just not worry too much about this. Uh, you know, there are times when we might want to consider the origin of preferences, where they come about, where, where do they come from, right? And there might be a deliberative function. Or we could say, look, we're looking at a situation where we expect that people already know what they want, right? And we don't care where it comes from. And we can just say, look, this is what they want. And maybe that is an empirical question. We can ask experts, what does Putin want, right, in this situation? And without an, a kind of this overarching assumption, like I say, it's an ontological statement about the world. Uh, or maybe to have a general theory that is predictive and gives kind of general ideas of what you should do in life. Maybe it is a good idea. It's a question of methodological bracketing, uh, and a, it's a choice that you make. And so that's what I see. And so when people say, oh, rational choice is self-interest, I'm like, it can be, uh, but it can also explain purposive behavior based on other th preferences. That's my point. That's what this is all about. And so, you know, and like I say, if you assume altruism and a prisoner's dilemma, well, it ain't a prisoner's dilemma anymore, Right. What makes a prisoner's dilemma interesting is whatever the preferences are based on amongst the actors, whether they're interested or self-interested or not, then it's a situation in which there is a incentive to defect and a Pareto, a, a better outcome that is being the cooperate, cooperate, an opportunity lost because people take advantage of that incentive. And so that's what makes prisoner's dilemmas interesting. And that's, you know, it, altruism, it, it might be part of it, might not. Only if the payoffs are a prisoner's dilemma, right? Support the characterization of a prisoner's dilemma, is it an issue? And so that's something that uh, I think is important to keep in mind in all of this. And that's my take on the effect of altruism on a prisoner's dilemma.